Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Protect Our Kids, uh, we really want to thank you for, for having us here to speak to you. Um, and so don't worry about me. I'm going to be blabbering. You guys go on eating. <laughs> That's important. We all need food in our, in our bodies. Um, let me just start off by giving a quick introduction to uh, Protect Our Kids. Uh, believe it or not, I never thought in my wildest of dreams this is something that I'd be doing in, in my life. I had uh, thought that there's better and bigger things to, to handle, but uh, this is the, the nature of our reality here. Uh, so real quick, just to introduce our mission. Um, we started off a couple years ago um, with the mission to inform parents about the scope of three things that's happening in our public school system. Um, comprehensive sexuality education, critical race theory, and historical revisionism. Uh, we call this our triple threat. And so for those of you who play basketball, uh, I grew up playing basketball, and that was always what our coach told us, the triple threat stands. Watch out for that. Um, so POK, I want to introduce you first here to our founder, Mark Schneider. He's over here. And I'm his younger brother, George Roscoe. <laughs> Uh, Mark is a uh, lawyer by trade. Um, he grew up uh, doing patent law and litigation uh, for uh, some big time companies, uh, was uh, legal counsel at Hewlett Packard for a long, long time, and then went over into private practice. But Mark uh, fellowships at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim, not too far from here. Uh, he leads their salt and light ministry. Um, and he's been very, very involved uh, in California politics here for the last 15, 20 years. Um, for me, I am a civil engineer by trade uh, and by day. Uh, I'm also a pastor um, at a church in Placentia, so just one city over, but I do live here in Orange. Um, I was born actually in Romania um, under the communist regime of Nicolae Ceausescu. Uh, my, my parents uh, had 12 children. I'm the eighth of 12, all right? And we came here to the United States after the revolution. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, reminds me of what we had to go through in Romania. My dad was even imprisoned uh, for the faith. And so we're grateful for everything America is and what it has stood for. Um, and so this is, this hits home for me. Uh, but if you want more information about Protect Our Kids, we have a website, protectourkidsnow.org. Uh, we, uh, we have a Facebook page where every single day we put a lot of posts there to keep parents informed. We have our own YouTube channel where you can watch videos that we post there. Uh, we have an Instagram account. And more recently, Mark and I just started a podcast. Uh, we called the podcast Say What? Because when you're going to be hearing what's going on, that's probably the reaction you're going to have. So... Diving right into this triple threat. What is the triple threat? Comprehensive sexuality education, critical race theory, and historical revisionism. So threat number one, we have to understand how did we even get here? How did America's public education system reach this lowest of low points? Well, first of all, it started off with a whole movement that has been in place of uh, dismissing truth as being absolute. Back in 1980, University of Chicago professor Alan Bloom declared in his now famous book called The Closing of the American Mind, he said that there's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of, almost every student entering the university believes or says they believe that truth is relative. So once you unhinge truth from an absolute being, transcendent being, make it relative, now we can redefine everything as we choose. Also, back in the 60s, we had the start of the sexual revolution. Uh, 1969, we had the Stonewall Riots. Uh, and if you're familiar with those, that started really um, the militant 
movement of the LGBT movement here in America that culminated in, in early 1990s of a very well-known book called After the Ball. And After the Ball was written by two gay rights activists, uh, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Manson, and they basically said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to outline a campaign in which, through complex, centrally unabashed propaganda, we're going to be firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising. Uh, we were always uh, used to propaganda in Romania. We rarely did, read the newspapers. Uh, we would try to listen to like the BBC on our radios uh, or especially uh, the, the Serbian radio to get our news. We would never listen to our Romanian news. And in here, they, they outlined three strategies. We're going to desensitize, we're going to jam, and we're going to convert. And what they meant by that is this, quote, being queer is more than setting up house, sleeping with a person of the same gender, and seeking state approval for doing so. Being queer means pushing the parameters of sex, sexuality, and family, and in the process, check this out, transforming the very fabric of society. This is Paula Edelbrick, a, a very big activist in this space. So you would think if with this entire movement that's been around now for decades, if they claim that our public education system uh, needs more of this and not less of this, then we should maybe see like skyrocketing results, right? Great results academically. Yeah. We have continued to spend close to the top countries in the world in terms of our spending, yet in terms of our performance, in terms of developed nations, we are close to the bottom. Let's look at just within the United States alone, out of the 50 states, California, which is very, very far left, uh, we are ranked 44th for K through 12 education. And yet we fund a lot of what you're gonna hear about today. We've also had a slew of laws and lawsuits that have gone through the last 50 to 60 years that has basically diminished our parental rights. And you see this table, with government encroaching on parental rights, a lot of different uh, lawsuits. The very most famous one is one called Fields versus Palmdale that happened just 16 years ago in 2005. And check this out. This is a very telling statement. We hold that there is no freestanding fundamental right of parents to control the upbringing of their children by introducing them to matters of and relating to sex in accordance with their personal and religious values and beliefs. Parents are possessed of no constitutional right to prevent the public schools from providing information on that subject to their students in any forum or manner they select. Basically, what the Ninth Circuit has said is that parents, you check in your students to the public education system, we're their parents now, tough luck. If not, do something else. Also, what we did is we summarized a list of 20, in the last 20 years, a history of the advancement of SOGI laws. You're gonna hear this acronym over and over, SOGI, Sexual orienta Orientation Gender Identity. Uh, starting way back in 1999 with uh, Governor Gray Davis, uh, which permits teachers and students to openly proclaim and display their LGBTQ status. Uh, we had even Governor Schwarzenegger in 2004 that redefined the word gender to mean perceived identity or appearance, behavior, whether or not that identity or appearance or behavior is different from their biological sex at birth. This happened in 2004. I always ask myself, where, I, where was I? And I forget, I was in high school. <laughs> um, and so culminating more recently to what is called the bathroom bill in 2013, the bathroom bill, parents, I'm a parent, two of my children go here to Orange Unified and I checked out the parent handbook. And if you go in there and you read the fine print out of that 73 page handbook, you will see that any student has the right to go in whichever bathroom they want today in the entire state of California. And then lastly, 2015, the California Healthy Youth Act, which mandates comprehensive sexuality education. 
So, triple threat number one, comprehensive sexuality education. I want you to watch this very short PragerU style video that Mark put together for our organization. What is comprehensive sexuality education? And why should you be concerned about it? Isn't education a good thing, especially about something as universal as sex? And if you're going to educate, shouldn't it be comprehensive? Well, maybe. It depends on who's doing the educating, who it's intended for, and for what purpose. Sex ed used to mean learning about human reproduction and was usually taught in high school biology. Not anymore. According to UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, CSE is a process of teaching and learning about the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. Sounds okay. Until that is, you pull back the curtain to understand who else is behind CSC and why. Organizations like CECAS, Planned Parenthood, Advocates for Youth, the Human Rights Campaign, and others which have motives for CSC that go well beyond what you might think. CECAS, or Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States, which despite the name is not a government organization, has recently rebranded itself to declare what it's really about. Sex Ed for Social Change, which it defines as a large scale culture shift. Not surprising since CECAS was started by this woman, Mary Calderon, who previously was the medical director of Planned Parenthood, a devotee of the eugenist and serial pedophile Alfred Kinsey. What about Planned Parenthood, another one of the big sponsors of CSC? This organization was started by Margaret Sanger, who believed abortion was a means to cull the racially inferior or mentally unfit from society. For Planned Parenthood, using a gender transformative approach, CSC is a means to transform gender roles and advance equitable social systems. Advocates for Youth, co-sponsor of an organization called the Future of Sex Education, sees CSC as a means of advancing social, racial, and reproductive justice and equity. This thing called intersectionality, which translated means victim identity politics, and of course, language inclusivity, by which is meant people's preferred gender pronouns. These are the groups behind CSC. But who is CSC intended for? College students, who presumably are mature enough to understand and weigh the implications of such material? <laughs> Not hardly. The audience is children. Grade schoolers, beginning in kindergarten, with sophisticated materials targeted to each successive grade. From kindergarten to second grade, teachers are advised to rely on books with titles like, Who Are You? My Princess Boy, and Jacob's New Dress. From third to sixth grade, we see titles like Uncle Bobby's Wedding, King and King, and It's Perfectly Normal. By the time kids reach middle school, the curriculums are so sexually explicit, we can't even describe them here. Which brings us to the purpose of CSC. It's hardly a secret. In California, the Department of Education published a 700-page document called the Framework that outlines in great detail the requirements of CSE. From this document, it's clear what the goal of CSE is. It's to promote a worldview, a worldview with four identifiable goals. The first of which is to advance SOGI ideology in all K through 12 public education. SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and conveys the idea that both sexual attraction and gender exist along a spectrum. One's biological sex is meaningless. CSE teaches children to embrace subjective sexual and gender identities if need be, through the force of law. The second goal of the CSE worldview is to sexualize children. CSE encourages children to become sexually active beginning in grade school. 
The evidence for this is amply provided in the various approved curriculums. The third goal is to destroy the nuclear family as the indispensable support of a healthy society, or at least the idea of it. CSE teaches that all arrangements and groupings of consenting adults are equally valid. Fourth and finally, CSE seeks to undermine parental authority. A parent's conventional understanding of sex and gender are taught as negative stereotypes and may even be signs of spiritual abuse. Parents are discouraged from viewing CSE teaching materials by a mass of bureaucratic red tape. Children are coached on how to get contraceptives, treatment for STDs, and even abortions, all without a parent's consent or even knowledge. Taken together, as CECAS' motto declares, the purpose of CSE is to bring about social change. But is this kind of social change a goal shared by taxpaying parents of children in the public school system? Should it be? Forewarned is forearmed. I'm Mark Schneider with Protect Our Kids. So we got to warn you, I'm going to be like a boxer right now this is going to punch you in the gut with the evidence and i'm going to go quickly through it so first of all when we talk about csc i want you to understand there's the law that mandates it that's ab 329 here in california 35 other states already have various various um, laws just like this there's the curriculum which actually makes its way into the school system and then there's the framework that the State Department of Education put together, which is a 700-page document that basically is a guiding document to, to teachers saying, here's how you should be teaching uh, on this topic. So I want you to understand that when you read the law, AB 329, you might say, oh, the law is very general, but it uses some key words that are very different. The first word is... I think all of us kind of grew up having sex ed, okay? They changed that. Now it's called comprehensive sexuality. So sex only refers to biology. Sexuality refers to everything, a person's biology, a person's gender, their gender identity, their gender expression, their behaviors, their thoughts, their fantasies, their eroticism. Yes, this is the definition of the word sexuality. Planned Parenthood has basically gotten the United Nations and the World Health Organization to adopt this definition. So if in the past we said we got sex ed, that's not what's being taught today. It's sexuality education. So here's what our, what our students have to go through. So first and foremost, from kindergarten, they like to introduce them. Remember the gender bread man? They've changed that now to the gender bred person because we want to be inclusive. And they basically tried to say that every part of us is on a spectrum. So your biology is on a spectrum. It's, it's not dual. The XY chromosome and XX chromosome, they're like, wait, 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 wait. There's the intersex people too. And so they're, they fall somewhere in between. Scientifically, that's incorrect. So just do some research on what it means to be intersex. They are still male and female or female. So then they say, well, then your gender identity, your, what you think you are, your gender expression, how you choose to dress to express yourself, and your sexual orientation, who you choose to love or be with, are also on a spectrum. So now kids are being told, you have to think about yourself in these four ways. And as you grow up, you get to decide in these four categories what you want to be. So a recommended book for TK through third grade, who are you? Some people say they are really only two genders, says this book. There are a few words people use, trans, genderqueer, non-binary, gender fluid, transgender, gender neutral, agender, uh, notorious, bigender, third gender, two-spirit. These are the books that the children are being presented, that they have these options. Then they are told in this book, babies can't talk, so grown-ups make a guess by looking at their bodies of who they are. Yes. 
It's Not the Stork, another book for TK through third grade, shows graphic depictions of full frontal nudity. We blurted these out for you. It shows dramatized erect penises. It labels the female sensitive body parts. In fourth through sixth grade, there's a book called Sex, Puberty, and All That Stuff. And it shows what you can do with your different body parts. It also normalizes masturbation. For fourth through sixth graders, they talk about gender, gender expression, gender fluidity, and they say that, you know what? There are negative stereotypes out there, but you know what? We're gonna teach you that you can be whoever you want to be. They teach seventh through eighth graders, junior high, and they tell them students may be in non-monogamous relationships. They call them partners. So don't just say, hey, you have a girlfriend, you have a boyfriend. Uh, you are being, you are not being inclusive. You have girlfriends, boyfriends, either, both. They're even told, and this is verbatim from the health framework. It says examples for spiritual abuse include using religion to justify abuse, insisting on rigid gender roles. So if your child raises their hand in school and they say, well, wait up, my parents are telling me that there's only boys and girls. They're going to use that against them to say, well, hmm, your parents are spiritually abusing you. They're teaching them how to define the three types of sex acts. Anal, vaginal, and oral sex. They're even giving them workbooks and saying, okay, let's have a fun game here. What can you do with your mouth? What can you do with, name the other body parts, and you can just connect the dots, right? Fun fact, since the anus is not part of the reproductive system, if someone chose to have anal sex without a condom or protection, pregnancy would not be possible. You see what they're teaching our kids? By the way, that is completely illegal. The FDA does not approve condoms for anal sex. And every gay man out there in this country will tell you that. There is even a gay rights activist in the state of Tennessee who has been giving us information about this because he has his own magazine and he's not allowed to advertise condoms in his magazine intended for gay men for this very reason because the FDA does not approve it. Yet they're teaching it to our children. Oh, you know what? If condoms don't work, there is something else called a dental dam. Why don't you just use a dental dam as the barrier so that way you don't get an STD? For ninth through 12th graders, they teach them how to access information from the ACLU um, the American Civil Liberties Union, I just call them the American Communist uh, Lib Lawyers Union. That's my name for them. They teach them how to go and get access to whatever they want without their parents knowing. Promoting statewide reading. Now, this is in high school. There is a book called SEX, the All You Need to Know Sexuality Guide to Get Your Teens Through the 20s and, and Early Teens. It talks about deeper manual sex, body fluid or body play, and much, much more. So this is the very first of the triple threat. Mark's gonna continue talking about what is critical race theory and historical revisionism.